Lanier, I'm Anthony Ayersman. We're here with uh, P.T. Thompson, who's the president of Champaign County Farm Bureau, and uh, Doc Don Sanders. Well, God, your hand is huge. <laughs> I was going to like swallow it. Okay, and, and Doc, <laughs> uh, and both are good friends of mine, so I do a hard time about it a little bit. Now, uh, uh, Doc Sanders is a, um, a veterinarian. Um, uh, what kind of veterinarian? Um, principally large animal veterinarian. L large animal veterinarian. He's an author. I think he's written like eight books. That's true. And uh, you were just recently named the Champaign County Farmer of the Year. <laughs> and who'd you beat out for that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Obviously, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. Right. And, and he has his own TV. You can see him on TV. This guy does a lot of things uh, all over the, in fact, all over the world for that matter. What was the last place you just came back from? Uh, Were you in China? Yes, I was just in China. recently. Mm -hmm. All right. Some of these books are called. Um, my favorite one is um, "Milking Them for All They're Worth." <laughs> that's my favorite title. <laughs> you believe it or not, that's also the most popular one, and it's I believe it. I believe it. In uh, China, Japan, Russia, Mexico. And there's another one uh, here, um, uh, and you have a couple of them there, uh, titled like "Blue Ribbon Guides to Like for." You know, um, uh, to a successful swine project. Sure, these are 4 H project books for children and right. their parents. Right. Okay. Now, um, I asked I asked you uh, in, in in a recent email to give us a couple of topics that you wanted to talk about, and you gave me three that I tell you what, a couple of, one of them scared the bejeebas at me, and that was the first one, and it that is a predicted world food shortage. Now, how did you come up with that as a topic? Well, that's in Tell the us, what, what, what do we have to worry about? Uh, the first thing is there's a basic premise that the United Nations has predicted that the world population is going to increase from 7 billion to 9 billion, maybe even 9.5 billion by 2050. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not meeting the food requirements of the 7 billion we already have. And as the quality of life improves, as we get more protein into these people's diet and, uh, and their standard of living improves, they're seeking more food and their, their uh, lifestyle as far as what they eat is better. And they're projecting by 2050, we're going to have to have an 80% increase in the food supply around the world. Wow, wow. You know, and we've just recently had, um, it wasn't this year, uh, I think it was either last year or the year before where there was a rice shortage yeah. and uh, rice I mean if you went to the local Kroger's I mean it just like doubled overnight it was amazing now is that part of the uh, is that part of what we're talking about here absolutely that okay. and corn uh, all the major crops that goes into the food staples okay now how do we how are we going to go about avoiding something like that is there something that we can do about it or is it just inevitable I think the first thing is, is we've got to change our mindset. We've got to start thinking about how can we produce more food and how, uh, and especially American farmers, probably can come closer to meeting the challenge mm -hmm. than most any other country. Because American farmers are very innovative and they adopt new technology as quickly as it comes along. The major issue that we need to look at is biotechnology. Uh, the ability to increase the yields of these crops through genetic engineering and that sort of thing. And yet we have a segment of our society that believe that genetic engineering of crops is the bane of the earth. Mm -hmm. We are doing things already, and we have for nearly 20 years, where we've been able to take a gene from a common bacteria and and put it into the corn genome, in other words, the mm -hmm. genetic code of corn, and corn becomes resistant to a thing called root rot, which is a major insect uh, parasite that affects the root of the corn plant, and it all falls down and this sort of thing and yields poorly. Formerly, we had to use powerful chemicals to control that uh, parasite. Right. Now, the corn plant is resistant, and so we no longer even have to use chemical fertilizer or chemical insecticides for that reason. Right. 
And they and uh, I think it's uh, I want to say uh, their ticker is uh, GDNA. Um, I, the name of the company. They're out of Berkeley, and they uh, genetically engineered strawberries to be frost resistant, which I yes. found fascinating. Of course, their stock just went right through the roof because now, you know, you're not having literally. And in California, that's that's a billion dollar industry. You know. Well, let's talk about something that's even more critical than that, and that is in Africa in sub-Saharan Africa, okay. where there's virtually 10 inches of rain a year and this sort of thing, they now have developed a barley plant that yields just as good as any barley that instead of re uh, requiring the irrigation they used to have where they had to irrigate it 8 or 10 times during the growing season, that this barley is resistant to drought and now they're watering it once. What a tremendous energy savings and that savings is, of water. That is really amazing. You know, when I was a kid, uh, it was all about Ethiopia. People were, you know, women and children were starving in Ethiopia. Right. You know, better eat everything on your plate, right? Yeah. Um, and I did, as I got older, I did a little research. Well, the reason there was a drought was because they cut down all the trees. Right. And basically, people stopped farming. If you yeah. stop farming, your land dr basically dries up. If you cut down all the trees, there's no canopy for to create the rainfall that you're going to need. They were actually finding uh, Ethiopian clay, which was a certain kind of red clay, it, that would blow up into the atmosphere from dust storms in Ethiopia, and it would make its way all the way around the world to North and South Carolina. So, uh, you know, and how we approach those kind of things and be smarter about it, I think, is probably going to get us, uh, uh, you know, a, a good portion of the way there. It's the other, say, the other 20%. How do we get to the other 20% of the way there? And, you know, there's something else interesting, and we've talked about crops, and uh, being a veterinarian, this is a passion of mine about uh, animals and this sort of thing. And in Ethiopia and other countries over there, Kenya and this sort of thing, when people are starving, the interesting thing is, and it just seems counterintuitive, that uh, the families have five to seven children. Mm. And as they become more educated and better off, they, as far as nutritionally, they have fewer children. They have fewer and, children. And Absolutely. so they'll get down to having two or three children. Now, one of the things that is really neat and very few people have heard about is that there was a study done in Kenya where they took 12 school systems with children in them and they split them up onto different diets uh, for these children. Uh, one diet was a very basic diet of the kind of cereals and vegetables they might have. The second was a blend that they made of a product called Githra which is more of a formulated uh, uh, I want to call it ration like I would for a right. cow but right. at any rate a diet that was had a blended amount of vegetables in it, formulated with the proper nutrients, and then they had that same Githra diet with milk, and the third or the fourth diet is they put uh, they gave them four ounces of meat a day, four ounces of meat besides this Githra diet, okay. and they did that for two years. And now let me guess, the one with the meat did the best because they had more protein. That's right, and the interesting thing was they increased their IQ scores by 12 points really? over the other people. 12 points on the IQ scores. They measured playground activity, and these kids had about a 40% increase playground activity. They measured muscle mass of their upper right. shoulder, and they were more muscular. Now you say, what about the milk diet as well? And, and to go back on the, on the, uh, to go back on the, on the little thing about uh, having a lot of children versus uh, having fewer children because they were more educated. They had a lot of children, but the, the length of their, uh, their lifespan was very, very short. It, they might have eight kids, right. but only one would actually survive to be 30 years of age. Right. Whereas the people who were educated might only have three kids, but they all made it to 50 and 60 years of age. Right. Yeah. So they actually were increasing their population. No, so the message know. is, uh, there's two messages in this. Is one is, is that children need animal protein if they're mm -hmm. going to develop to their maximum capacity 
neurologically and intelligence-wise and this sort of thing. And then I think it says something else. What about our children in this country that are raised on vegetarian diets? You know, I have never personally met, my, my brother was a vegetarian. He wouldn't eat meat for a long time, unless he came home for like Christmas or Mother's Day or something like that, and then he might have a piece of chicken. But I always thought he looked sickly. Every, I, I don't know what it is. I'm sure they're some very healthy looking. Don't, don't start emailing me every vegetarian in the world. Start emailing me. But it's just my own personal experience. They were all really kind of skinny and they didn't have a lot of muscle mass. Uh, they didn't have that pink in their cheeks. But, you know, that was just on my own observation. Now, uh, let's go on real, real quick. Uh, you have it on here, organic food and its carbon footprint. Now, people are, you know, uh, hamburgers used to be great before McDonald's. But because they, uh, uh, don't all start, don't McDonald's start <laughs> calling me too. But I mean, it, and, it's, and it's not that McDonald's has a bad hamburger, because they have a good hamburger. It's just that they generally, they, uh, uh, they've set out a certain thing, so now all hamburger tastes the same. It doesn't taste like grass-fed uh, calf anymore, and which is what I grew up on and tastes delicious. Now, I would consider that organic. If you're buying local and you're not spraying a lot of chemicals on it, I would consider that probably pretty organic. Now, does it actually have a higher footprint as far as a carbon footprint? Are we using more energy to create that organic food or not? Well, in, let me preface that by saying everybody should be able to select their own choice. Right. I have no problem with somebody that wants to eat organic. I have no problem with that at all. Where I have the issue is, is those people that are eating organic and saying they've reduced the carbon footprint over somebody in production agriculture. And generally, that's, that is not the case. And but that is, the organic producers can't use the modern day chemicals we have that, mm -hmm. that are generally recognized as safe to control a lot of these things, so it requires more tillage. It requires more passes over the field and this sort of thing. Do you know that I mentioned earlier? Probably your lower yields. So when you start absolutely. to when you start to weigh these things out, you go, "Wow, you know, I'm making this lower much yields. food up here, but my carbon footprint is here. I'm making only this much food over here, and my carbon footprint is just slightly lower than, say, a regular." That product. is uh, uh, one more. That food. That, there is one more thing in addition to that, though, and that is when they are able to. Uh, use genetic modified crops, genetic mm -hmm. engineering, this sort of thing, and they control a lot of these things. It's that many less passes over the field. Whereas when they're doing it organic, they have to do it by tillage, and so they're stirring the soil and releasing carbon into the air. So that's another issue uh, that's related to it. Do you know that using genetic modified crops on the fields uh, in the uh, per year is, is the equivalent of reducing 441,000 cars on the road. Wow. Using genetic modified crops. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, that's one way of uh, 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 helping end our foreign dependence on oil. <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, well, and, and as, I, as I thought when, we, when I sat down here that we weren't going to have enough time to talk to both of you, so we're going to have to have you both back because these are, uh, for me anyway, they're fascinating subjects. So, um, and, and so will you guys come back on again? Sure, I'd love to. We'll let you just, we'll just yammer on for another <laughs> half an hour until we get to everything. Yeah. All right, let me, uh, let me uh, close the show by saying uh, first that we have, um, you can always follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. You can view our shows online at www.urbanaleader.blogspot.com. Also, our Facebook page also has all the shows on it, so you don't have to wait for it to come out on TV. You can always watch it online. You can always email us, and please do so, because we'd love to hear from you at, especially if you want to complain to me about, um, you know, <laughs> organic food or whatever it is that I just said, uh, or battle leader at hotmail.com. Now, uh, just a quick uh, update. Online, we are seen in 20 countries around the world, uh, 41 states in the United States, 
330 cities in the United States. 112 of them are in Ohio alone. So uh, keep visiting us online, we, uh, and, and please do emails. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks for viewing the program. Have a good day.